Goeie dag en welkom. Mijn naam is Amarijnske en today I will be reviewing The Messenger's Legacy and The Skull Throne by Peter Fibrat for 3.5 or a short novella about Briar and point four, uh, book four in The Demon Cycle by Peter V. Brett. I'll start with a short review of The Messenger's Legacy. It's a Briar story. Briar is a character that's first introduced in book four, but it's his background story about how he accidentally burned his family's house, which made his family be totally devoured by demons. He is the only one who survives and he blames himself the rest of his en entire life for what happened. He is uh, a mixed child, which he is a combination of a Krasian and a Greenlander. So he has a mixed colored skin. He understands both languages, but he barely speaks. And nobody actually knew he was alive until later in this book. It is discovered he survived. They tried to get him back into like the church of the religion of the place he is found at, but he doesn't want to. He, like I said, he barely speaks. And he actually fights the demons. Most people in that area are still scared of the demons. Like there is the hollow, which is where Alicia lived and lives now. They fight demons. But in this place, they still hide behind their wards and are not really fighting a lot. But our little Briar actually does find the bog demons and the demons that live near there. He found a way to repel them, which in and of itself of a six-year-old child is actually really smart. And he found a way to, like a place to sleep and to live and a way to live. Also, he steals from the church, which was actually really a funny twist because in the end, like the priest in the church actually discovers who is constantly every like seventh day, I believe they call it. He puts down like fresh bread and water and such for their God, but it's stolen almost every time. And at a certain point he discovers his briar and everybody thought briar was dead. Turns out he is still alive. I thought it was pretty funny like how ingenuous briar was in stealing because the priest constantly came up with new things to discover him and he was too smart every time except the last time. You will have to read it. If you like this series, like this is such a recommendation. It's, it's it's such fun. It it still has the dark, a demon war type of aspects to it. But since it's the perspective of a child, it's like most of the, uh, of the book is quite innocent. While well, we don't only have a perspective of a child, we on, on, also have the perspective of Reagan, a messenger that appeared in book one, who found Arlen and raised him basically from age I believe eleven on when he walked, ran away from his father. So that character reappeared and I loved it because that character basically is like, it's such a sweet father type of character. It's like, I love that character. So sweet, so caring and all that kind of stuff. Oh, and his wife finally comes with him on travels. But I like that too. It's like such a nice twist to that relationship. Now we go on to the Skull Throne, which basically takes uh, takes off just after the end of the uh, the Daylight War, part three. And I'm going to spoil that book now. So if you don't want to be spoiled for like near, the near ending of book three, I recommend you either go away or like mute for a while, but probably just go away because to talk properly about this book, I need to spoil the ending of book three, which was a cliffhanger that did nothing to me, by the way. So I'll start it now. The cliffhanger is about Arlen and Jardier who are fighting. Uh, I am, I've forgotten the term. Let me use the Crasian library in our dictionary. See if I can find it. 
Sharum something. They are fighting an honest duel between two fighters at uh, near sunset, I believe, which is, by the way, not the smartest time. And at the end, they both uh, not jump, but fall down a cliff. It's not really a fall. Arlon pushes and they disappear. Like, they are not fallen, uh, found at, at the bottom of the cliff at all. So it, it starts off with that point of the story. In the beginning, we still have like a couple of scenes with Arlen and Rena in it. I'm also going to uh, to spoil Arlen and Rena's relationship. They are married, which like it, I believe it happened either at the end of book two or the beginning of book three or something. I find it so unrealistic. I had a feeling they like they had met like once as children, and then Arlen saves Rena. They are together for like one or two month months. Have been traveling and fighting demons, barely know one another, and then all of a sudden they get married, which is so weird to me. Like, we barely know Rena. I feel like they could fit together, but I also feel like Rena is just an arrogant ish, also very selfish person. Like, I get what she has survived with her, uh, uh, like, sexual abuse by her father. It totally, like, it warrants at least a little bit how she acts, but. I don't necessarily like all of the points of her character. I also don't like how, like, all of a sudden Arlen changed when they met. Like, it's a almost a 180 change in character. And I found that to be very unrealistic too. But we see so little of Arlen and Rena and Jardier in this book. That it, it's like, I know book 5 will focus on them. But I still have no clue why Arlen and Rena actually fit very well. Like, you would think Arlen and Alicia would end up together, like, at, to what happens at a certain point, but also not because they don't really seem to fit very well. Still not in this book, but also not in the previous ones. And I like this book so much more better that I did not mind the simplest, relatively simplistic writing in this anymore. There is a lot of political intrigue happening. The Krasians are again attacking all kinds of cities and places in the Greenland world. But this time their leader has disappeared. So his son has taken over and made the most stupid decisions. We have like stuff in happening with twist. Like, you expect it, but you don't know exactly how or when it's going to happen. But don't fully expect it. There is deaths in here that were so incredibly sad. Even though before I started this book, like there is stuff happening to a Roger and even like Jardier's sons. Characters I did not care in the slightest about anymore after book three. And I was like cheering or crying about stuff that happened to them. And you also discover that both sides have like humanity but also very very cruel brutality in them and i found it a nice twist like of course that's human but in most fantasies you have like one bad side and one good side who constantly are bickering and fighting against one another it happens here but also they try to get everybody on the same page about anything and they constantly try to say that the real uh, uh, enemy are the demons but still, are they? Like, to me, it starts to seem like, of course, the humans are scared. But is it not just nature? I mean, of course, it, like, it is brutal what the demons do. But that also takes, like, a weird twist in this book in the way that we have a group of people at a certain point who are not only defending themselves uh, against the demons and killing them simply for defense and to keep their families and friends safe but who are sincerely going to hunt them so they can kill a specific demon and you don't know what the reason is like you they might have hunted them or might want to hunt it because it kills a lot of people but it's not specified why they are hunting that specific demon except for the fact that it is really big and would give a challenge and I, I can stand that, like, I get you would, would to, wanted to fight and kill for defense. 
but why are you going to hunt something that can kill you in one swipe? It doesn't make logical sense at all. It looks like those people lost their brains. In the beginning we also, or near the beginning, we have a scene with Roger and his two wives, Amanva and Sikva, who are together with Kendall, with the four of them, two fiddler, fiddlers, violin players and two singers who are going to lure demons, a couple of demons, to a certain spot and make them die by fighting and killing one another. I found it excessively gruesome and cruel. I mean, those books are meant to be like horrific and horror and gruel. gruesome because they are like horror fantasies. But that seems just excessive un and unnecessary because it is already dark and gruesome enough as it is. We did not need that much unnecessary violence and gore at all to make the point that it is scary and dark and you don't want to be near those demons. That was already clear in book one. I don't get why it was like why that happened. So that knocked some points down. But all in all, I still enjoyed it and I now want to know how this ends, simply to know how it ends. Like I want to know what happens at Arlan and Jardier's travels to the core with the other characters that are involved in that plan and like how this actual mess of a world will either build up again or at least how the biggest mess will end. Because the demon already th told Arlen and his uh, fellows that there was like a big swipe going on on the earth but not from demons to humans but humans killing one another which actually was going on. The Krasians were doing stupid shit, they had to pay for it but like on every side like a lot of people die. I am totally a fan of the quote that does not at all come from this book but war has no victors or the song Krieg kennt keine Siege by Soltatio Mortis covered in English by Vandem Plus. Um, that can be found on Spotify. I might see if I can find a link to that and put it in the description. I don't think it will work because Usually I cannot uh, link specific songs, it doesn't work properly. Um, but it totally fits these books because you can see that everybody loses and nobody really wins. There are characters who constantly say that like, if they die and they got caught, they deserve to be caught and killed. I thought, how can you say that stuff about your own family? Don't you love your own family? Like, it shows like how cruel and brutal people can become just by the way they are raised if they are either denied or given their own victories and praises which some of the characters haven't had and some have all had a lot of so I thought it is well done you would think by the plot that they fight demons and such that it is plot driven and it is but it also is very heavily character driven and politics driven too I thought it was a perfect combination because usually I don't like so I usually I hardly ever I like solely plot driven books because like that is just boring that's just characters reacting to their environments in character driven book uh, books the characters make the decisions but usually if you live in real life it's a combination of both you only have control about your own body your own thoughts and feelings but there is still a lot of stuff happening in real life that is out of your control and that is also what is showcased in this books like decently well. Sometimes you cannot gauge all the consequences, sometimes you don't know what is going on and like sometimes you are just in bad luck. But I thought it was really well done and I would totally recommend these books. Now that I have read, read book 4 I think it will end up that I agree with the people who say that book three is a total and a total uh, like crap fest in the middle of the series, or it suffers from middle book syndrome. I think that is what it's called, like when the middle book in the series is crappy. It is necessary. There is stuff in there that if you leave it out, it's like the series becomes like out of balance. 
because you don't get why a Navarra's perspective becomes so important. But still, like, this, this book had to, a lot to make up for, and it did. So, I like it a lot. But this is it for now for this review. Thank you for watching and on to the